Okay. Yeah, thank you. I'm okay. Yeah, it's family. Water. I was going to bring it up, but I couldn't remember. I'm trying. I'm trying. No kids. kids. My kids have me on the run right now, so hopefully. Mm -hmm. I know. That's my time. Kids. Kids. Can you get outside the corporate limits? Look at this rolling at the moment. Oh, my kids know I fight back. It's somewhere around here. Yeah. Sounds good. I don't want them to go away permanently. Good evening, everyone. This is the regular meeting of the DeKalb City Council, June 26, 2017. I'd like to ask Deputy City Clerk Ruth Scott to call the roll of the City Council, please. Jacobson? Fanukin? Here. Marquardt? Here. Fagan? Here. Norico? Here. Verbeck? Here. Favor? Here. Smith? Here. Seven present? I'd like to ask police officer Keith Arkey to please come forward to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Keith. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Officer Gerke. We now need to approve the agenda for this evening. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda as printed? If not, I'd ask for a motion to approve the agenda for this evening. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Fanukin, seconded by Alderman Fagan to approve the agenda. Any discussion? If not, roll call, please. Fanukin? Yes. Marquart? Yes. Fagan? Yes. Norico? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Favor? Yes. Smith? Yes. Seven yes. Before we move on to our first uh, item on the agenda tonight, that is, we do have a public hearing. Um, I did get a uh, text from uh, Dave Jacobson, who uh, who is uh, having continued back problems. His back is hurting him, and uh, so he will not be with us tonight. He said he was going to be watching us on TV, and I hope we can cause as much excitement for David <laughs> as if he were here. You know, don't take his call. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, we have a public hearing uh, now, noting the time at 6.02. Uh, this public hearing <coughs> is on the Community Development Block Grant Comprehensive Annual Performance and Evaluation Report for the program year 2016. That's from April 2016 to March 31, 2017. Our Neighborhood Program Specialist, Joanne Rouse, will make the presentation. Joanne? Mayor Smith, members of council. Um, the CAPER, or the Comprehensive, the Consolidated Annual Performance Evaluation Review, is a HUD requirement, and it must be submitted within 90 days of the end of the program year. Um, the document provides information on the accomplishments and the expenditures that were made during the 12-month period. Um, members of council were given an executive summary that sort of summarized the report for your review, that summary plus the full caper have been posted on the city's website for 15 days in an effort to secure public comment. Um, the public hearing tonight is the closure of that public comment period. Um, 
the purpose of this hearing is just to collect public comment. Um, any comments that are received by the city will be included in the plan and, and in the final submission that is made to HUD. The CAPER is strictly an informational document. It does not require action by council, but council may ask questions or submit comments. Are there any questions or comments? Prior to any questions or comments from uh, city council, uh, are there any folks in the audience who wish to address any questions on this? If not, any questions or comments to Joanne from city council? Kate. Thank you for your work on this report. Um, can you tell me what are the plans uh, <coughs> going forward to improve the figures regarding the um, housing rehab grants? Um, I noticed that there was money left over. There was some, you know, mention of that mm -hmm. in the report, but I'd be interested in what plans you have for moving forward. For moving forward, um, the city will invest in the, the same projects that we have in the past. As far as the private property rehabilitation, there are plans to increase the marketing on that program to mm -hmm. get more information out to community agencies on the city website, brochures, because we do have funds available and we would love to be able to serve people who are income eligible and need that service. Mm -hmm. um, we will also be um, working on a public facilities project. The one from 2016, which was a large project, was carried into this year. So mm -hmm. it will be accomplished this year, mm -hmm. um, which is a big portion of those carryover funds. And um, public services, again, fund those agencies in the, in the community that provide public services. For the ho uh, housing rehab grants, is the information also available in Spanish? I believe we do have a Spanish brochure someplace. I will. Okay, because you know I would encourage that in working with Conexion. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions of Joanne by City Council? We should respond to all comments made during the public review process. Of course, there were few. Mm -hmm. uh, however, no other City Council action is necessary. Uh, Joanne, thank you very much. I thank appreciate you. your report. I will now close the public hearing at 6.06 .06 p.m. Moving on to item number E on tonight's agenda. We are so fortunate that we're going to be able to do what we're going to do over the next couple of minutes. Uh, I'd like to ask Fire Chief Eric Hicks to provide a introduction to this item. Uh, I'm going to then, uh, at uh, Eric's cue, move down to the front and be uh, participatory in a couple of uh, presentations. Eric? Good evening, Mayor and Council and staff. Uh, first up tonight is we are here to witness the swearing in and badge ceremony of our newest firefighter, Joe Long. If I can get Joe and his family to come up here, please. Growing up, Joe Long was exposed to the fire service through his father's work as a volunteer firefighter with Caneville Fire Protection District. During Joe's junior and senior year at DeKalb High School, he took part in the Kishwaukee Education Consortium Fire Science Program. Through this program, Joe discovered the fire service and what he really wanted to do for a career path. And he attended classes uh, during his uh, junior and senior year at the DeKalb Fire Station and also the Sycamore Fire Station. Uh, and that's when he decided he wanted to be a firefighter in DeKalb. Uh, after graduating from DeKalb High School, he, has earned, he earned an associate's degree in fire science from Obonsi Community College, and uh, shortly thereafter, in 2012, he earned his paramedic certification. Joe's work history includes uh, him joining the uh, Caneville Volunteer Fire Department as a cadet at 17, and he'd volunteered there for six years. And in 2012, he started working as a firefighter EMT at Fox River Countryside 
where he remained there until he was hired by the city of DeKalb just recently in 2017. So Joe tonight is gonna be pinned by his wife, Caitlin, and with her two children. If I can get uh, Deputy, Chief, or Deputy Clerk to come up. And Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Joseph Long, I, Joseph Long having been appointed to the position of firefighter for the DeKalb Fire Department in the city of DeKalb, county of DeKalb, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Illinois and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of firefighter to the best of my ability. Congratulations. Congratulations to Joseph Long. Let's give him another hand. Thank you, Joe. Now we'll move on to another special item, proudly DeKalb, and once again, our Fire Chief Eric Hicks. Tonight we're gonna to talk about some awards that were received downstate by some of our local firefighters. Uh, on July 5th, 2016, a fire occurred in a home in the city of DeKalb. One off-duty firefighter and 13 on-duty members of the DeKalb Fire Department were involved in the rescue of an unconscious victim from the fire room and the extinguishment of that fire. Tonight, we're here to honor their efforts on that day. Uh, the DeKalb Fire Department has an in internal firefighter award program to recognize personnel for extraordinary work. These awards range from a department letter of appreciation to a department award for valor. And it was felt by us uh, that for their efforts on July 5th, they deserve more. Uh, so we did nominate them downstate uh, for the State Fire Marshal's uh, Award. At a ceremony on May 9th, 2017 in Springfield, Illinois, Governor Bruce Rauner and State Fire Marshal Matt Perez honored 10 members of our organization. Two distinct awards were given. The Firefighter Medal of Honor, which is, given, which is the highest level award in the state, and that was given to Firefighter Jared Thorpe for his actions off duty that day. Also, nine, uh, other, eight other members received a award, uh, and those would be Captain Mike Thomas, Firefighter Andrew Romano, Firefighter Matt Klotz, Firefighter John Ritter, Lieutenant Brett Goucher, Firefighter Tim Steiker, <coughs> Firefighter Chris Krupa, and Firefighter Todd Adamson. Uh, due to vacations, uh, we only have four of these members here today. Uh, I'm gonna show you a short video uh, of what we experienced downstate that day and also talk about the incident a little bit. So if I can get uh, Jeff Bertel to cue up the video, please. The Firefighter Medal of Honor is the highest award given by the state of Illinois to a firefighter for an act of outstanding bravery or heroism by which the firefighter has demonstrated in great degree the characteristics of selflessness, personal courage above and beyond the call of duty under adverse conditions with the possibility of extreme personal risk. On the screens, you will see the stories of our recipients. My name and rank is Jared Thorpe, a firefighter paramedic for the city of DeKalb. 
I started back like way back when I was a kid. My dad uh, volunteered in uh, our local town. I just grew up watching him going down to the firehouse. Uh, I knew I wanted to be on the fire department, like helping people. Uh, so when I was able to, I was 16, I joined uh, Hinkley as a volunteer and then started working my way up to be full-time. Uh, on that day, I was uh, off-duty, uh, running some errands with my girlfriend. Uh, we happened to be coming through town. Uh, I heard the tones go off. We carry a pager, um, it was, and it happened to be open. I heard the tones go off for a structure fire with possibly two people trapped. Um, ironically, it was like right down the street from where we were at. As I made the corner, I uh, saw flames out the second story window. Um, obviously knew that none of the units were in route yet, so I decided to stop. I see the family out in the front yard. Uh, as I stopped, um, the, the lady in the front yard told me that her grandson was up in the second story of the house. Uh, and they couldn't get him out. Um, I decided to make my way up to the se second story of the house. I could tell it wasn't that bad of conditions yet, so I tried to go up and see if I can get to him. Um, the door was, um, couldn't get open. He was stuck behind the door. I was able to force through out into the door uh, and reach him. At that point, it came really smoky, so I came back down to get a breath um, and then tried to go back up and get him. Went back up a second time. Conditions had changed, got a lot more smokier. I uh, reached him again, but still couldn't get to him uh, to pull him out, so went back down. By then, the crew was showing up and uh, told him, you know, found there's only one person, found him using the first bedroom up on the hall, uh, and they went up and made the rescue. Uh, so like I said, we got the best group of guys to work with, and I couldn't be more proud to go to work every day with those guys. Because firefighter paramedic Jared Thorpe of the DeKalb Fire Department demonstrated an act of outstanding bravery and heroism, he is awarded the Firefighter Medal of Honor. This is originally going to be, uh, these awards will be given to by Representative Robert Pritchard. Uh, he's unable to attend today uh, due to being downstate on a special uh, uh, call. So if I can ask the mayor to come up, he's going to read a short letter from Representative Pritchard and then we'll uh, show the awards that were given out that day. Thank you. This is from our representative, uh, Bob Pritchard. Dear Mayor Smith and council members, I regret that I could not be with you tonight as originally planned. I am in Springfield in special legislative session where we're making progress toward a budget and some real reforms. I wanted to add comments to those of Chief Hicks about the Fire Service Medal of Honor ceremony last month in Springfield. I've asked the chief to share the General Assembly certificate signed by your four senators and representatives. The city of DeKalb and its residents should feel proud of the fire department and the men and women who serve them. The awards the two companies and Jared Thorpe receive for saving a life are significant accomplishments and acknowledgments of the professional skills and commitment of our fire service employees here in DeKalb. We can all feel safer knowing such men and women are not only capable of responding to emergencies, but also ready to respond at any place at any time. We would like to add my congratulations, I would like to add my congratulations 
and thank them for their service. Thank you too to the City Council for providing the support for them to do their jobs. Sincerely, Robert W. Pritchard. Thank you, Mayor. If I can get Deputy Chief McMaster to come up along with uh, Firefighter Thorpe, Captain Thomas, Firefighter Klotz, and Ritter. What the deputy chief's going to do is he's going to present the actual award that was given to uh, Jared uh, the day of the uh, event down in Springfield. Okay, I'm going to present uh, and help present the awards. I think Jeff will probably hand those out to these firefighters who are in attendance tonight. Uh, Firefighter Jared Thorpe, Firefighter Medal of Honor. has to make you feel good it makes us feel good to have people like you with us believe me okay now the citation excellence awards captain Mike Thomas from Tuck Company one <laughs> firefighter paramedic Matt Klotz from truck company number one And finally with us tonight, firefighter paramedic John Ritter, truck company number one. Before I turn it over to you, back over to you, Eric, I just want to say that I've been on the job now for five weeks. This is my sixth week as your mayor. And I was so fortunate to be able to have some tours with public works, with uh, uh, Tim Holdeman with the police department, with Gene Lowry and with Eric's. Not only that, was able to visit your palatial abodes in the three <laughs> fire stations you have, but I was also able to uh, see some of your equipment, some of it out at the airport and in other places around the community. And uh, I'm just so fortunate to have been able to see some of the things that a lot of our folks in our community don't see, you know? Uh, but believe me, we have some fine men and some white, from fine women in our fire and police departments. They're protecting us, looking out after our safety. Gentlemen, thank you very, very much. Let's give them a hand. As the fellows go around the table, I'm going to turn it back over to Eric Hicks. In front of you tonight, you'll see a program of the actual event that day, and you can see the different awards that were given throughout the state. As you can see, there were only three Firefighter Medal of Honors awards given throughout the state of Illinois, so it's a pretty good accomplishment. We're very appreciative of these awards, and I'm very thankful what these guys do every single day. But I just want to make sure these awards do not overshadow the other uh, 5,600 calls that they run every day. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. Now we go under item number two, under special items and presentations, and we do have a presentation. Uh, Diana Hulst from the DeKalb County Youth Services Bureau uh, will make the FY 2017 Human Services Funding Annual Report. Diana is the Executive Director of DeKalb County Youth Services Bureau. Diana? 
Thank you very much. And I want to thank uh, the City of DeKalb for the continued support of the DeKalb County Youth Service Bureau, YSB. Uh, we've been in um, service here for over 45 years, starting out as a branch of the City of DeKalb, and then in 1971, joining uh, two other Youth Service Bureaus, being the first initial three Youth Service Bureaus in the state of Illinois. Each quarter, between 40% and 60% of the people that we serve come from the city of DeKalb. And um, over the past year, from June of 2016 to June of 2017, we have served 684 city of DeKalb residents, providing a continuum of early intervention and therapeutic interventions um, to help better the lives and relationships of DeKalb County citizens. Uh, lately, one of the most critical um, programs that we have that have has received um, funding from the city of DeKalb is actually our crisis intervention program. Our crisis intervention program serves uh, youth on a 24-hour on-call basis when they have either run away from their home, are refusing to go home, or have been locked out of their home by their parents or guardians. And we have seen a, a more complex uh, set of cases lately involving more uh, follow-up and referral linkages and this at a time when our, our state funding for this program has actually been on hold due to the state budget crisis. Um, so again, the support from the city of Cal is really critical at this time. The referrals that we get from crisis intervention come mainly from the police, um, the schools, and from DCFS. And the goal is to provide stabilization for the family and family preservation services to avoid DCFS and court involvement. Um, We've seen uh, 36 cases over this past year, with 19 of them being from the city of DeKalb. Our Youth and Family Counseling is our largest program, and we help youth and their families that are struggling with a number of different issues, including um, anxiety, depression, school behavioral issues, parenting concerns, family conflict, violence, um, sexual abuse, self-injury, and uh, just traumatic experiences in general. We have two bilingual therapists on staff to serve our Spanish-speaking families. And our, our clinicians right now are completing a 70-hour certification program on therapeutic interventions for traumatic stress. So that way our staff can have the greatest tools and um, broadest base of skills to um, help families going through these traumatic issues and help them build healthy lives and relationships so they can have better futures. Another way that DeKalb County Youth Service Bureau is helping um, improve the futures of DeKalb youth is through uh, the work that we do with the court services, with our diversion and our early risk assessment programs. Um, these are uh, programs that youth can be referred to in lieu of legal ramifications, and they're designed for first-time offenders. So we provide an assessment that shows how likely the youth is to reoffend, and then based off of that assessment, we look at both the protective, proactive uh, things in the youth life to build upon, as well as the adverse conditions to help mitigate. And then we refer them and enroll them in any one of our different YSP programs, including um, several of them, including. Um, youth and family counseling, um, early intervention uh, for drug and alcohol use, anger management, um, and YSB's Valentine Community Service Program. Um, for those youth that actually go through the um, early risk assessment program and complete the services as um, assigned, um, there is a 4% recidivism rate um, as compared to the 20% national average recidivism rate for juvenile offenders. Um, so it's been uh, quite um, pro productive of a program. Another way that we're working with um, court services is we're actually looking to uh, branch off and also target the uh, repeat offenders for juveniles that are already on probation or court supervision, working very closely with uh, juvenile probation officers um, and having the juveniles go through a 25-week intense course, um, which really targets the criminal thought process and behavioral issues, um, utilizing the evidence-based program, Thinking for a Change. Uh, six of our staff went through a week-long training with uh, probation officers, um, and we are hoping to do a class um, co-facilitated with juvenile probation starting in September. Um, we've heard um, a lot of talk about the number of juvenile offenders um, that are repeat offenders eating up a large amount of uh, police time and um, resources and how a relatively small number of juvenile offenders are accounting for a great number of uh, calls for juveniles and we want to do something that we can to help mitigate this issue. Um, 
as a youth service bureau here, we're here to serve the youth of DeKalb and look at the needs that the city of DeKalb is currently having. And this is one of the current needs. Um, and so we're looking to do everything we can to step up and meet that need. Um, and again, I thank the city of DeKalb in helping continue our funding and so that we can, as a community, um, help serve the youth of DeKalb. Thank you. Okay, Diana, before mm -hmm. you leave the uh, podium, any uh, comments or questions of Diana? If not, thank you very much. Thank DeKalb you. Kelp County Youth Services Bureau, Diana Halston. As promised uh, last uh, meeting, I have a few appointments. There <laughs> are just a few. I think the City Council can attest to that. Um, I would ask if it's the wish of the City Council to approve the appointments and reappointments in omnibus form, and you could do that with uh, one motion, uh, but I do need a motion to approve if you <coughs> feel that is appropriate. Uh, with consent of my colleagues, I'll move that we uh, approve uh, 3A through X in on the omnibus form. Second. Been moved by uh, Alderman Finucan, seconded by Alderman uh, Kate Norico. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. M Mayor, aye. if I could ask uh, prior to the vote if we could just briefly recite the appointments. Absolutely. It doesn't have to have the terms, but just the position and name. Oh, okay. Position and name and uh, commission and, and name. Okay. Uh, before we vote. Uh, appointment of Robert Owens as chair of the airport advisory board. Do I need the, the term? No. Reappointment of Tony Chulik to the Board of Fire and Police Commissioners. Reappointment of Deborah Booth to the Citizens Community Enhancement Commission. Reappointment of Brad Hoy to the Citizens Community Enhancement Commission. Reappointment of Susan Johnson to the Citizens Community Enhancement Commission. Reappointment of Susan Johnson as Chair of the Citizens Community Enhancement Commission. Reappointment of Dan Kenny to the Citizens Environmental Commission. Appointment of Dan Kenny as Chair of the Citizens Environmental Commission. Reappointment of Ken Cook to the Citizens Environmental Commission. Reappointment of Claire Cron to the Citizens Environmental Commission. Reappointment of Bill Alecno to the Citizens Environmental Commission. Reappointment of Sharon Scala to the Citizens Environmental Commission. Reappointment of Eric Hicks to the Fire Pension Board for three-year term. Appointment of Joan Berger to the DeKalb Public Library Board. Reappointment of Wendell Johnson to the DeKalb Public Library Board. Reappointment of Janice Kurtz to the DeKalb Public Library Board. Reappointment of Vernice Edgel Walden to the Economic Development Commission. Reappointment of Larry Apperson to the Human Relations Commission. Reappointment of Larry Apperson as Chair of the Human Relations Commission. Reappointment of Robert Williams to the Human Relations Commission. Reappointment of Norton Gilbert to the Human Relations Commission. Reappointment of Lisa King to the Human Relations Commission. Reappointment of Christina Atherton to the Planning and Zoning Commission. And reappointment of Christina Atherton as Chair of the Planning and Zoning Commission. We have a motion on the floor and a second to approve these appointments and reappointments. Any further discussion? Deputy City Clerk Ruth Scott, roll call please. Marquardt? Yes. Fagan? Yes. Norico? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Favor? Yes. Fanukin? Yes. Smith? Yes. Seven yes. We'll have just a few more, hopefully, at our first meeting in July. Suffice it to say that uh, that was a pretty good list. And, you know, I must just add that I think as city council members and as the public, we really need to acknowledge the time that these citizens st spend stepping forward and serving uh, as volunteers on our boards and commissions. I certainly thank them. Okay, public participation. 
is there anyone registered or is there anyone who would like to speak to any topic not on the agenda for tonight? You will have your chance if there's an item on the agenda. If not, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Again, for the benefit of those uh, watching and those of you here tonight, the consent agenda is enacted by one motion. Uh, there will not be a separate discussion of these items unless requested by a council member. Do, are any of these uh, items, do I have a request to remove any from the consent agenda? The consent agenda items are as follows. Approval of the City Council minutes, minutes of the Special Committee of the Whole Meeting of June 1, 2017. Receive and file accounts payable and payroll through June 26, 2017 in the amount of $1,812,376.42. Resolution 2017-077, authorizing the execution of a workers' compensation lump sum petition and order in the amount of $31,530.43 to Kevin Farragan. And Resolution 2017-078, authorizing the execution of the DeKalb County Emergency Services and Disaster Agency Memorandum of Understanding. Again, for the benefit of our audience and for those at home, uh, our City Council has been provided copies of all of these items and have had a chance to take a look at them. We now need a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Been moved by Alderman Norico. Second. Second by Alderman Favor. Roll call, please. Fagan? Yes. Norico? Yes. Verbic? Yes. Favor? Yes. Vanukin? Yes. Marquardt? Yes. Smith? Yes. Seven yes. Thank you. Moving on to item G, items for separate action. You have to. If we could have a motion to approve the listing on the consent agenda. A motion to approve the listing on the consent agenda. Okay. A motion to approve the listing on the consent agenda. So moved. Been moved by Alderman Norico. Second. Second by Alderman Fagan. Roll call. Norico? Yes. Verbic? Yes. Favor? Yes. Vanukin? Yes. Marquart? Yes. Fagan? Yes. Smith? Yes. Seven yes. Thank you, Dean, for correcting me here. Uh, items for separate action. Number one, resolution 2017-079, approving the final plat of Cornerstone subdivision and approving certain final plans for Cornerstone. I was uh, informed late this afternoon that Joe Ellen Charlton, our community, relation, our community development director, uh, has a small addition to uh, this resolution. Uh, we could go through the entire resolution and then we could amend it, but she thought it might be easier if she could just add that addition and then we could vote uh, on the resolution. Joellen. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I'll explain the, the small difference uh, when I get to the end of the report so that um, you can use that information in the formulation of your motion. Um, but as you know, the final uh, plans for Cornerstone subdivision were required as part of the ordinance that was approved earlier this year that uh, granted the approval for the project. Since that time, obviously, a lot has been happening on the site. Uh, the demolition of the building has been completed, and uh, some of that work down in the pit of the, the construction site has also uh, continued with the removal of the old foundation and kind of shoring up and putting in the new foundation. So the developer at this point is, is at the point where they can't go any further until the approvals are granted that are before you tonight. So as you might recall, that original development agreement provided that um, we come back to you with some of the final plans that um, outline the details that weren't available at that time. The staff report goes through a number of those details and I'll just hit on some of the highlights of those uh, requirements. 
four-sided architecture was something the council talked about. As you recall, we saw some really nice pictures of the north and um, west elevations of the building, and there was concerns that we wanted to make sure that the materials and the windows and uh, everything on the south and east sides of the buildings were, were similar. The only um, thing that I'll point out uh, that, that might look a little different is on the eastern elevations. The east side of the building contains some of the public aspects of the, the apartment building complex. So you have the office and the um, uh, entertainment room back in that location. So rather than having kind of the ceiling to floor commercial grade windows, uh, in Exhibit 1, you can see that eastern elevation, and it includes a higher uh, window in those areas. Again, it just provides for a little bit of privacy for the residents who are using those rooms. Uh, another element that was required is uh, that some kind of a decorative element be added at the top of the building elevation. On the top of page 2, you can see that a decorative cornice has been added to the top of the building with the similar types of light-colored material that are used on the other parts of the building. Uh, the ordinance also included provisions uh, that lighting standards be or utilize a consistent standard. So the wall packs that are on the buildings as well as the lighting standards that are freestanding uh, ground light standards in the parking lots uh, need to be unified. The wall standards are all unified. We do need to finalize some of the items for the pole mounted lights when we understand a little bit more whether we're going to move forward with the first street improvements that we talked to the council about a few weeks ago. Um, we are moving forward with the um, traffic consulting engineer and expect to be bringing that back to you. Uh, but at, the, at such time as we're ready to forward that recommendation, we'll be looking at providing you with more information on the ground lights. Awnings and signs shall be consistent for the building was another requirement. Um, you can see in the elevations provided on page three that they are proposing to incorporate uh, consistency in their awnings on both the north and west elevations. Um, something new that you didn't see in the first elevation was the Cornerstone DeKalb uh, building uh, identification sign at the top of the building. Those signs are permitted as part of our sign code and the overall square footage that is available for wall signs. So he can have those wall signs there. It will be up to him then to distribute the, the balance of the square footage that's available to the other tenants. But we've done a, a brief calculation that's provided in the report and are confident that he can work within those guidelines. Uh, the door on the northwest corner of the building shall be recessed, and I provided a, a picture of what that's going to look like. Basically, the door itself is going to be on an angle between First Street and Lincoln Highway. There is a pier that's there for support of the building at the very corner, but behind that pier is where that cutout will occur. Um, we are also uh, to provide final details on the location of security cameras and fiber optic service and Wi-Fi. Those are items that uh, the resolution that's included for your consideration provides uh, various city staff with the opportunity to work with him on finalizing those items. Uh, we've also provided, made provisions for public utility easements if they are necessary on the site to be granted. Uh, we did confirm that bollards and curbing, I think there was a concern initially whether the pedestrian walkway on the east side of the building not be treated like an alley, that we didn't want a curb cut, we don't want people driving through that area, uh, which is only about 10 feet wide. The plans themselves provide curbing barriers, um, both on the north and south sides of the building to prevent that from happening. Um, the overhead wires need to be relocated and um, uh, from the alley. So currently the existing property had the buildings on the north and then the alley and then the Barb City Bagel building. That alley, as you might recall, is being vacated as part of the Plata subdivision that's actually on um, are included in the resolution for your consideration. Um, a parking lot agreement shall be uh, finalized that accomplishes uh, some of the things that were outlined in the original agreement and those terms um, we're going to continue to work on with the developer and bring that particular part back. Again, that's something that relies a little bit on what we do or don't do with the First Street um, project that's coming back to you shortly. Um, the developer did uh, provide some indication that he's going to be providing bike racks uh, and a bicycle parking area. 
and that location will be in the um, in the area in the um, common area between the in the u-shaped part of the building uh, also as part of the the approval we'll be looking at the common garbage dumpster that is currently located just off of the developer's property and we'll be working with him to finalize uh, the details of that of that design and construction um, Moving on, we, um, we had outlined a couple of options for the council's consideration. Uh, one is to approve the resolution as presented, which outlines all of the items that are uh, enumerated in the staff report. Also, this, the second option was to approve the resolution with some modifications. So as in any project, we oftentimes find ourselves responding to last minute things and uh, just today we received a call from the developer who is working with ComEd on the relocation of those overhead power lines that are currently in the alley. Uh, those lines are intended to be relocated to the south and cross the city's uh, property at the south end in the parking lot that we currently own. So what I'm asking the council to do is to amend section 2B of the resolution to add item number 11, which will be XI, uh, Roman numeral 11, uh, and that would give staff the authority to negotiate uh, an easement agreement with ComEd or a public utility easement agreement for uh, the location of relocation of the overhead wires uh, to the area that's indicated. So um, again, I don't think you have a motion on the floor, so if you do make a motion to approve the resolution, uh, we would ask that your motion include that amendment. And again, that's an amendment to section 2B to add item number 11 to authorize staff to negotiate a, utility ease, a public utility easement agreement. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone might have about what's before you. Pat? Um, I'd just like to say I, I'm glad you've got the recess in the front door that was a concern to some people for that corner. And I want to thank the developer, John, thank you for doing that. Okay. I just have a general question. It appears that everything is moving along pretty expeditiously. Is the project pretty much on target in terms of the estimated timeline it is um, you know we keep um, pretty close contact with John I, a lot of my days began and end with a phone call from John um, and uh, he does have his construction permit documents in for review and mm -hmm. I understand that those are really close to being approved so he is on target to finish the demolition work um, in the pit that he's still working on uh, his plans should become available for full release of the permit soon. This approval needs to be granted in order to issue those permits so that mm -hmm. he is very much on target. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I also appreciate the efforts that were made um, to do the demolition in as quiet a way and you know as clean a way as possible. There's, there's no way getting around the fact that you know, demolitions create noise and chaos for a while, but I think, you know, sincere efforts were made to minimize the impact on area businesses, so thank you. John, John has been very responsive to any question or concern that has come up. I mean, it's a development project. You're going to have issues, yeah. and the important aspect about John that I've appreciated during this project is he's available, reachable, and he takes care of it right away. Any other questions or comments? I'd entertain a motion then to uh, <coughs> approve this resolution, including the provision of the ComEd Commonwealth Edison scenario described by Joe Ellen. So moved. <laughs> Been moved by Alderman Ver Verbeck. Second. Second by Alderman Fagan. Any further discussion? Any discussion from anyone in the audience? If not, roll call please. Verbeck? Yes. Favor? Yes. Vanuken? Yes. Marquardt? Yes. Fagan? Yes. Noriko? Yes. Smith? 
Yes. <laughs> Seven yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you, Joellen. Item number two, resolution 2017-080, receiving and filing the FY 2016.5 comprehensive <coughs> annual financial report, audit report, and management letter. I'd ask a motion for one of the aldermen to open the item up for discussion with a motion. So moved. Moved by Alderman Fanukin. Second. Second by Alderman Marquardt. We now have a report on this from our interim finance director, Jeff Wilkins. Jeff? Good evening. First, uh, first, I'd like to recognize the staff that uh, that did uh, the the yeoman's uh, effort to uh, to put this together. Our former finance director Kathy Haley, Robert Miller, our assistant finance director, and Susan uh, Heilman, uh, our accountant. Uh, they went from uh, uh, basically a, 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 a an audit of 16 to a budget of 16.5 to an audit of 16.5. So they were very busy during that period of time. So I'd like to recognize them and also applaud the city for uh, its its commitment to transparency as you apply to a GFOA for uh, for the distinguished uh, presentation awards for the CAFR and the budget both. So uh, so I wanted to do that before uh, and then now. Uh, Brian uh, Lefevre, he's with Sikich. Uh, he's a partner with uh, Sikich, uh, who uh, is the, uh, the signed partner for our process, uh, audit process. So I'd like to turn it over to him to give a quick presentation on your, uh, uh, on your financial statement for uh, uh, year ending December 31, 2016. Well, thank you very much, Jeff, on behalf of Sick, I'd like to thank the mayor and members of city council for inviting us to present some brief comments on the comprehensive annual financial report for your short six month uh, year ended December 31st, um, 2016. The comprehensive annual financial report consists of three sections. An introductory and statistical section are the beginning and the end, and those are non audited sections. And then the financial section is the audited section. And what makes it a comprehensive financial annual financial report are those those first and third sections, uh, which a lot of work is done, especially in the statistical section by the city staff. Um, within the introductory section, um, as Jeff alluded to, uh, Roman numeral three, um, and if you're in a PDF, it'll be you know probably 20 pages into the report, um, is the award that the city received for its CAFR for the June 30th, 2016 year end. I believe that was the 23rd consecutive year that the city received the Government Finance Officers Association Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. Um, as leaders uh, of the city, you should all be commended for participating in this program. It's very well recognized in the local government industry, um, and this is the highest level of financial reporting um, within the, the local government community. The financial section, as I mentioned, is the second um, section. If so, if you, if you do have a hard copy and you turn to the financial section tab, the first document you'll find is on Sikich letterhead. Um, and this is where we give our opinion on the financial statements. In order for us to give an opinion on the financial statements, we're required to follow two sets of standards. The auditing standards, which are issued by the AICPA, tells us the types of procedures that we need to perform when we're conducting our audit. And then the financial reporting standards are issued by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, or GASB. And GASB tells us what this document needs to look like, what the statements need to look like, et cetera. Um, as a local government, you're required to follow the GASB reporting. Once we follow those two sets of standards, we can then issue an opinion on the financial statements. We're pleased to present an unmodified opinion. And what that means is that the financial statements are presented fairly in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles free of material misstatement. And this is the highest level of opinion that you can receive on your financial statements. Within the auditor's report, which is three pages, you'll note that on the third page, there's a paragraph that references other reporting required by government auditing standards. That specifically is referencing a second document, which is the single audit report, which is a document or a special compliance audit that's required by the federal government any time that you expend more than $750,000 in federal funds in any particular reporting period. I say reporting period because even in the six month period, the city expended $836,000 in federal funds 
Um, and that's and that's also a commitment to to you all for being involved in programs that the various federal agencies feel are worthwhile to participate in. There's there's not as many uh, local governments that are subject to a single audit as there were um, years ago. Um, within that single audit report, there's two opinions that we also give in that report. One is a um, unmodified opinion on laws and regulations that could have a material impact on the financial statements. The second piece then is where we test a specific major program. This year was the mass transit grant and we also had an unmodified opinion on compliance with um, that major program. Finally, there's also a separate document related to the two, uh, the two city uh, tax increment financing districts. We're also required to do a compliance audit related to those, and we had an unmodified opinion for the TIFs as well. So all all good news um, in terms of the uh, the reports that we've issued. I'll walk you through just a couple things in the document, and then uh, be happy to answer any questions. Um, as you know, the CAFR is a large document. It's intended to be transparency, so it's our job to tell you what the highlights of those documents is. So if you choose not to read the entire document, you know where to start. The executive summary for the uh, CAFR is the management discussion analysis. The reason I always direct folks to that is because that was written by the city. The city gets an opportunity to explain some of the whys of its own financial statements in that document through a prescribed format, but yet enough latitude to explain to you, the users of the financial statements, how things compared from one year to a six month period is a little bit of a challenge, but you get a general flavor for how the financial statements are laid out. Um, and because this document is prepared by the city, it becomes an insert in the final document, has its own separate pagination, and after the 13 pages of the management discussion analysis, you come to the first audit of financial statement, which is on regular page number four, uh, which is the statement of net position. I like to refer to the statement of net position as the global view financial statement. If you take all of the funds that you budget and appropriate for and consolidate them all into two columns consisting of governmental and business type activities for all of your assets, including capital assets, all of your liabilities, which effective uh, two fiscal periods ago include the net pension liability for your IMRF police and fire pension plans for the first time, you know, we're going on, on the third reporting period for that. That's what you have with the statement of net position. It's not a super user friendly document. It's not how you budget and appropriate, but it is required to receive that unmodified opinion. And you are compared to your peers to a certain degree with this presentation. You'll notice one item, the unrestricted net position is a big negative number. That's simply because you're putting the net position of your pension, net pension liability onto the financial statements causes that to be negative. The good news is, and we'll see that in the pension area, is that you're funding the pensions exactly um, as in recommended by your actuaries for the police and fire pension plan, and then statutorily as it comes from your actuary, uh, the state's actuary for IMRF. So you're doing, um, you're doing what is um, re recommended by those actuaries in funding those pension plans. Within just a couple of the statements, page 10 is the um, statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balances for governmental funds, which includes your main operating fund, your general fund. During the six month period, um, your, your revenues were just higher than your expenditures by 25,000. You then had some required um, transfers for some debt service payments. So overall, you had to decrease in fund balance of 255,000. If you compare that to your budget and also read your management discussion analysis, you actually projected to have a budget or a, a loss of if you will, of expenditures over revenues of 450,000. So 200,000 to the good compared to the plan for the year, uh, leaving you with fund balance in your general operating fund um, to begin the fiscal year that you're operating in now of, of just over $9.2 million. Your operating statements for your other main operating funds, your water fund and your airport fund are on page 15. Um, so you'll see a slight decrease in your overall net position, both for the water operations and the airport operations. Keep in mind that these are reported on an accrual basis, meaning your depreciation on your capital assets is reported as, a, as an expense, um, as opposed to the dollars that might have gone out in capital outlay during the fiscal year. So do caution you in looking at those numbers. 
Um, the last statement to, to bring your attention to you before I show you uh, where the information you can find related to your pension plans, if you turn to page 19, page 19 is a consolidated statement, uh, income statement for the two pension trust funds that are managed by those separate pension boards here locally, the police pension plan and the fire pension plan. Um, both uh, of the plans, um, six month period was a very good period for investment activity. Um, so overall you had an increase of just under $5.1 million um, to the total of those two plans. So as of December 31st, uh, the police and fire pension combined were at 57.2 million in assets at market value. Further back in the report, you can find the separate information for police and fire separated out on pages 139 and 40. The last section I would bring to your attention this evening um, before I opened up for questions would be on page, beginning on page 87 is information related to the Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund. Page 87 shows for each of the last three fiscal periods um, where the new GASB standard was effective, shows you the actuarially determined contribution and then the actual city or employer contribution. Um, you notice you're always contributing exactly what the actuary recommended because that's you contribute to each and every payroll um, based on a percent and that percentage was calculated for the city itself. Um, and you put those dollars in. So you can see the budgetary impact there on page 87. Page 88 and 89, which are facing each other for the police and fire pension plan, you can see that the um, city has um, essentially put in close to uh, what the actuary recommended for the first three periods that you see, and then um, the city put in additional dollars into those plans uh, for the six months ended December 31st, 2016. That's, all, that's one piece of the plan is did we put in during the year, did we put in what the actuary recommended? The other piece is the health of the plan as well as begins on page 90. And that is to say we have two pieces of the equation to a pension plan. The actuary calculates what they estimate to be the liability for all the active members plus the um, the pensioners that are drawing a pension from the plan, that liability is estimated by the actuary using their, their techni techniques and their assumptions to come up with the total um, estimated liability. That's compared to the assets that are in the plan. The math then becomes the net pension liability. Oftentimes we look at a pension plan based on how much we've filled the tank. So our assets divided by the total liability says what percentage um, we have set aside. <clears throat> if you look for IMRF through December 31st, 2016, on page 90, uh, three, three lines up from the bottom of the page on the right-hand side, you can see you're 83.2% funded um, for IMRF, um, up from 81.8% uh, one year prior to that. For the, on page 91, uh, the police pension plan was up from 47.1 to 47.9% funded. And then on page 92, the fire pension plan went from 37.4 to 39.1% funded. Uh, you will note um, that both police and fire pension plans had um, changes in the assumptions that were used related to mortality. There's been new mortalities that tables that have been released that say in th that we're living longer, that causes your pension liability to go up. So when those assumptions are changed. The last piece of the puzzle for uh, the police and fire pension plan is, you can, as I mentioned, um, the rate of return for a six month period of 5.12% for the police pension plan and then on page 94, 5.93% uh, for the fire pension plan. In conclusion, uh, the audit went very smoothly um, and we received all the information on a timely basis um, from the city right on target where we anticipated presenting this information to you tonight. And uh, as Jeff mentioned, no small task given the, uh, the city's change in fiscal year, which uh, required a number of resources uh, for the city to deploy uh, to make that fiscal year end change and then still be ready for um, the audit, like I said, on a timely basis. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have this evening. I was able to uh, <laughs> chat with uh, Kathy Haley prior to her coming and I realized some of the uh, 
idiosyncrasies, I guess, if you will, when you go from one fiscal year to another. Um, I also feel that it's good to have two sets of eyes look at this, and I, I realize Sikich is looking at it and our folks are looking mm -hmm. at it. I'd be interested in Jeff's view. I know you've only been here a few weeks, but you've been around the block with these kinds of statements in your, in your past uh, life, in your past career. Give us, could you give me your, your take on where we are and, and I certainly respect, is it Brian? Yes. Yeah, uh, and uh, Sikich's report, but I'd like to hear it from, from you. As far as where, well, the, as far as the reports themselves, I mean, these are well put together reports uh, and very, very comprehensive. Right. So, uh, and not all communities do a full CAFR. They might do audited financial statements, which wouldn't have nearly the detail uh, that you have in the beginning and, and not nearly the statistics that you have. So, uh, so this is, this provides a lot of information for, uh, for, for citizens. So I think it's, that's fantastic. You know, obviously though, as far as the position, you know, you know, Brian had just mm -hmm. touched on the uh, the, the uh, liabilities of the pensions. Mm -hmm. You know that's uh, that's going to be uh, that's going to be an ongoing challenge, and uh, and you have to be committed to that. And uh, it, it's not going to happen uh, overnight. You know, it didn't happen overnight to to get to the situation that you're in, and uh, it's gonna, not going to be overnight to get out of it. So, but um, but I will say um, uh, the other part is is with a six, just a half a year. Um, the the aspect that we were we were better than budget uh, by two hundred thousand dollars is definitely a good uh, a good thing but but it's it's difficult to, to compare a half a year to a whole year so um, so that's it's that's hard to uh, really have a, a conclusion on that uh, there was one statement in here about how our our fund balance had, had increased to like 40, 40 some percent uh, that might be a little bit uh, uh, you know a little bit misleading in that uh, uh, you know there were on half a year, you're just not going to incur all the expenses. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it was definitely better than projected. So, uh, you know, so I, I, that's definitely a, a, a good thing. So, yeah, my question wasn't to get into the minutia of this. Uh, you know, we're fortunate to have Mike Verbick, who was on our financial advi finance advisory committee. Mike, do you have any first glance view of this that you'd like to share? And if not, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but. Tell me, I put you on the spot. Right? <laughs> no, it, it's it's great to have uh, this transparency and this much information, and certainly would look forward to the uh, response from our finance advisory committee. Any further discussion from anyone? Jeff and Brian, are you? Does that complete your report? Anybody yes, from? Thank you. Excuse me. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, if there be, if there is no further discussion, uh, I'd like to ask the Deputy City Clerk Ruth Scott for a roll call. Favor. Yes. Fanukin. Yes. Marquart. Yes. Fagan. Yes. Norico. Yes. Verbic. Yes. <clears throat> Smith. Yes. Seven. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. <coughs> Next on the agenda, item number three, resolution 2017-081, authorizing the Public Works Director to extend the professional services agreement with WBK Engineering, LLC, for city engineer services in an amount not to exceed budgeted amounts and for a period not to exceed 180 days. Uh, before we have our Public Works Director Tim Holderman make some comments, I uh, entertain a motion to get this on the floor. So moved. Moved by uh, Alderman Marquart. Second. Second by Alderman Favor. Tim Holderman. Thank you, Mayor. Members of Council, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to give you an update and to request authorization to extend the professional services agreement with WBK for city engineer services. As you'll recall, in 2016, the city eliminated the project implementation engineer position. And early in 2017, uh, the city engineer resigned, leaving the Public Works Department with no engineers uh, on staff. 
As a result of that, um, we interviewed five firms uh, locally and uh, came back with a recommendation in February, uh, February 27th of this year uh, to undertake um, a, uh, to authorize an agreement with WPK. Uh, WBK has been uh, working with city staff uh, since then. They have provided excellent services. Uh, we have monitored their activity and been very judicious in the assignments that we have given them in order to maintain the budgeted amounts. Uh, the budgeted amount for engineering services is $166,350 for fiscal year 2017. We're averaging about $12,300 a month right now over the three months uh, that we've been uh, engaged, um, which is below the budgeted amounts. Uh, the average uh, budget uh, that we're targeting for is about $13,800. So we're about $1,500 per month lower uh, than the budgeted amounts. I've been working directly with uh, the principal from the firm, Greg Chismark, who has extensive city engineer experience. The city council uh, has seen him as well, give several presentations. Uh, Greg was um, very instrumental in getting some of our project, continuing uh, advancement of some of our project. Greg and I worked with John Laskowski to identi identify some of the critical issues with our public infrastructure projects. We have about 10 major projects. And so it took us several weeks uh, just to identify the issues surrounding those projects, uh, remembering that uh, Greg and his staff are working on average five or six hours a day for us. Um, so, uh, but we have been able to do that. Uh, we've also made a significant advancement in organization of some of the records uh, that engineering had accumulated uh, over the years. And so we're uh, making great advancement that. Uh, Greg and his staff are also helping us on day-to-day -day engineering requests and support of our staff. And so on that side of the city engineering equation, the public side and the day-to-day -day side, we feel very comfortable uh, with where we are. Uh, what we haven't done much on is uh, thinking about on the private development side. There is engineering. Um, tasks and uh, requests that have to be fulfilled on that public or private development side, primarily site plan reviews. And what we'd like to do is uh, work with community development, public works and community development working together to kind of develop a plan to address that part of city engineering. Okay, It's not uh, as extensive as the public engineering is, but it's still very important in the overall um, plan going forward to provide city engineering services. So that's why we've asked for the extension of 180 days. What our plan would be to, is to come back uh, on or before August 14th with a specific recommendation for addressing city engineering, that's both public works and community development engineering, and then move to implement that plan in the fall and winter uh, and have something uh, implemented by the end of this year. And so that's why uh, we want the 180 days. First is to finalize the plan for city engineering and then actually implement that plan, which would mean either recruiting and rehiring an individual to provide uh, city engineering within the city or going out for requests for qualifications and selecting an engineering firm uh, to do that on a contract basis. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Alderman Fanukin. Uh, Tim, I noted that the 180 days takes us to the last eight or nine days of December. Why don't we just do it through the end of the fiscal year up to December 31st, unless that's uh, uh, exceeding 180 days would be a problem. I just think that would be, uh, I think I would like to propose an amendment that it, this would be through the end of the fiscal year. Excellent. I would second that. Would that. Be, yeah. Okay. You've, we've had an amendment to the motion authorizing uh, the agreement extension uh, through December 31, 
2017. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. It's been moved by Alderman Fanukin, seconded by Alderman Marquardt to amend this motion, the original motion. Um, any further discussion? Roll call, please. And this is roll call on the amendment. Yes. A roll call on the amendment. Mm -hmm. That is correct. <coughs> Fanukin? Yes. Marquardt? Yes. Fagan? Yes. Noriko? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Favor? Yes. Smith? Yes. Seven yes. Now we go back to the original motion on the floor. Uh, any further discussion? Hmm. Nothing else, Tim, for, from you? No, sir. No, sir. Roll call, please, on the original motion. Marquardt? Yes. Fagan? Yes. Noriko? I'm confused. This would be on the original motion as amended. Oh, as amended. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> Verbeck? Yes. Favor? Yes. Vanukin? Yes. Smith? Yes. Seven yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Item number five, resolution 2000. Oh, I think resolution number four. Yeah, resolution number four, 2017. Dash 082, authorizing an engineering services agreement with Baxter and Woodman for construction of 4,050 feet of water main in an amount not to exceed $117,000. Before uh, Brian Faber, our utility superintendent, uh, describes this, uh, I entertain a motion to open the item for discussion. So moved. Moved by Alderman Faber. Second. Second by Alderman Verbeek. Brian? Thank you, Mayor. This resolution is seeking approval and agreement with Baxter and Woodman for construction engineering services re relating to the water main replacements that we have scheduled for this year and that were approved at the uh, last council meeting. Uh, Baxter and Woodman has provided the design work for the, uh, for the work that is uh, to occur, and so they're very familiar with the scope of the project. Uh, work is scheduled to begin uh, mid-July, within the next couple weeks. Uh, there are multiple locations, which include work uh, in actually three wards. Wards three, four, and five will have water main replacements being performed. That's East Sunset Street, Lewis Street, South 11th Street, and Maplewood Avenue. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions regarding the uh, engineering services or the water main replacements. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, any questions of Superintendent Favor? If not, roll call. Fagan? Yes. Norico? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. <clears throat> Favor? Yes. Fanukin? Yes. Marquardt? Yes. Smith? Yes. Seven yes. Thank, Thank you, Brian. Mayor. If I could mention one more thing, sure. the uh, utility division is uh, planning a meeting on July 5th, Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, to discuss the, the project in greater detail for either the council members or the mayor or our residents that would want to hear more information about the projects. That's July 5th at 6 p.m. at the water division, the utility division located at 1216 Market Street. And it's really just an opportunity for our residents, especially the ones that will be affected by the, by the work, um, to you know just answer questions uh, relating to those projects or potentially future projects. If there's areas that you hear from uh, constituents that uh, you know maybe they feel that their water main needs to be replaced, you know it's it's an opportunity to open it up to the public to uh, discuss that. Yeah, these are the kind of special meetings I think we need in our city, Brian. And I would urge you to uh, chat with staff here, Lauren or whomever, to see that this not only gets in the perhaps in the newspaper or news release, but gets on our website and some of our other uh, media outlets. Sure. And we sent out a letter to the residents that are affected and also mentioned Good. that the uh, meeting. And then also um, we've posted on our website, I believe, and Facebook. It, it has been posted. So uh, we're trying to get the word out, and I just wanted to bring it to your attention as well. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Moving on. 
Item number five, resolution 2017-076, authorizing a purchase on a state of Illinois Department of Transportation public transit vehicle state bid price contract with Midwest Transit Equipment Incorporated for the purchase of three paratransit minivans in an amount not to exceed $123,750. If you recall, this was one of the mm -hmm. items that was on the agenda for our last meeting, but we pulled that off because we wanted uh, the uh, uh, DSATs to take a look at this. And speaking of DSATs, we have our man Brian Dixon here. But uh, before he makes some comments, I'd like to um, entertain a motion to bring this up for discussion. So moved. Moved by Alderman Marquardt. Second. Second by Alderman Favor. Brian Dixon. Yes, good evening, Mayor Smith and Council. Um, I bring before you uh, a request for the purchase of uh, three minivans uh, for an amount not to exceed $123,750 um, for uh, VAX uh, existing uh, three minivans have uh, exceeded their, their useful lives. In fact, two of them are no longer operational. So we're looking to move forward <coughs> on uh, the purchase of uh, three new minivans to replace those existing minivans. Uh, staff had, uh, um, has already gone uh, through the FTA process uh, for approval of the purchase of uh, these minivans along with uh, several other uh, uh, paratransit uh, vehicles which we will be bringing forward in uh, the near future. Uh, we're moving forward a, a bit quicker on the minivans because uh, um, they are being pulled and being uh, off the market and uh, being retooled. And so we wanted to get this order in as quickly as possible. As noted, we pulled it uh, less uh, agenda um, to uh, bring it forward to the um, DSAT's uh, policy committee and they reviewed the purchases and have approved them and as noted we have the FTA funding uh, to fund the entire purchase of these minivans. Um, uh, we go through the IDOT uh, consolidated vehicle procurement program. This uh, is a program uh, for rural and urban um, transit uh, agencies to purchase um, uh, mainly paratransit vehicles. Uh, we go through, we elect to go through IDOT because the FDA has an extensive uh, list of requirements and we don't have the, the staff time or expertise to go through and to adhere to all those requirements. So we prefer to go through um, an order on the, the IDOT um, um, contract with Midwest Transit for these vehicles. So um, as noted, uh, we are seeking approval uh, from council uh, to uh, move forward with uh, submitting a purchase order to Midwest Transit on the, the state of Illinois contract uh, for the purchase of these three minivans. Thank you, Brian. I've learned so much over the last several weeks as your, your mayor, probably more than I ever thought I'd ever know about transportation and buses and all that. But you know, we're very fortunate to have Bill Finucan, uh who is, uh, uh, his transportation I think is his middle name, uh, and uh, he is on the DSAT board and has been very helpful to me and I know to others on city staff uh, as it relates to transportation issues. Are there any uh, comments or further questions? Just if I may real quickly. Mr. Transportation <coughs> no. himself. Just yeah. the, uh, the IDOT uh, bidding process for these vehicles is very slimmer to what we've done with police vehicles, buying them off the state bid. Uh, it it uh, certainly makes sure that it meets all the needs. Uh, I am uh, personally familiar with Midwest Transit. They're a very reputable vendor. There's a uh, very good purchase and we should move forward. 
That's why we need you right where you are, Bill. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion or questions of Brian or, or Bill? If not, roll call, please. Noriko? Yes. Verbic? Yes. Favor? Yes. Finucan? Yes. Marquardt? Yes. Fagan? Yes. Smith? Yes. Seven yes. Motion carried. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Number six, resolution 2017-083, authorizing a fuel supply branding agreement with World Fuel Services. Ascent Aviation Group, Inc. for aviation fuels and services to the DeKalb Taylor Municipal Airport from June 29, 2017 through June 28 of 2020. Our airport manager, Tom Cleveland, will be at the podium in just a second to explain <laughs> this to us. I entertain a motion to get this on the floor. So moved. Moved by Alderman Noriko. Second. Second by Alderman Marquardt. Tom Cleveland. Mayor, Council, thank you. Uh, every two to three years, the City of DeKalb sends out a request for proposals for a fuel supply uh, to the major fuel suppliers in the country to supply aviation fuels to DeKalb Airport. Uh, this year, we, see, we received four bids uh, from uh, AvFuel, Aero Energy, Epic Aviation Fuels, and uh, World Fuel Services Avi Ascent Aviation Group. Um, after thoroughly evaluating all of these bids, uh, we, come up, we came up with that the Ascent Aviation Group was the best value for the City of DeKalb to supply fuel to the airport. Uh, World Fuel Services Ascent Aviation was not the low bid, they were a second low bid, but again, they, they, with what the services they would provide to the city and the airport, became and is the best value for us. And here are a few of the, the bullet points. Uh, global networking, global customer base, global marketing, they have free training and new hire training for the line personnel or fuelers. Uh, their fuel terminals on the south side of Chicago, which is very close. 24-hour um, jet fuel delivery, low credit card fees. Uh, the Phillips credit card is 0%, which is nice when they use that for us. Uh, free equipment when needed. And again, we're doing this jet fuel incentive program. If we did get uh, a whole uh, bunch of traffic in at one time, we could call them up and we could have another fuel truck sitting there within 24 hours. Um, they have a large U.S. corporate base that uses World Fuel. Uh, they have marketing incentives for us and support. Uh, their co-op pays for marketing events, uniforms, and clothing for the line personnel that fuel. Uh, they have comp competitive fuel pricing. They're branded Phillips Fuel, which is very well known in the industry. Uh, they have aviation conference support where we go out and market the airport, market, market our fuel prices. They, they support us doing that. And they have uh, quality qual control inspections that they come out every two, year, two, two times a year to inspect our fuel farm, fuel, and personnel. Uh, so World Fuel Services and Ascent Aviation, again, pro provide the best value for the city of DeKalb. Again, they're not the lowest fuel price. They're second to the bottom. Um, so I'm gonna, I would recommend that World Fuel Services Ascent Aviation Group, we go with a three-year contract with them. And I'll answer any questions. Yes, all in favor. So you had mentioned, I was, that was the question that was gonna, that came to my mind is, uh, will this or does this have any impact on our low margin fuel uh, pilot that we're doing now and then should we go forward if it if it becomes a success and we go forward is there any impact by choosing one of these vendors yeah what what world or ascent aviation group can do for us again they have marketing people that help us market our airport and our our fuel so again it's it's global so we can put it anywhere you know if we're trying to get a an asian or european company to come to decal they're going to help market it for us you know, so they, they are very well known in the industry, um, and they, they do help us market our own airport. But there wouldn't be any impact if we decided to continue with the, uh, with the low margin fuel program. Mm -hmm. I mean, the price we pay them is 
Correct. Regardless of and what we're we with sell them it for. right now. So no, there's no, okay. no impact. Again, we can get fuel within 24 hours though for the jet fuel. Is I don't know if anybody else has a question. Is Epic are they is that one of the the benefits that they over Epic is that they're uh, 24 hour delivery. Epic has 24 hour, but their fuel terminals are farther away. Okay. So again, we d I did ask for a 60 day extension, you know, 60 days ago, because all these bids were so close. We really had to evaluate these, really see which one would be the best value for the city decal. Mm -hmm. So that's why it took us so long. It was very close. And some of these items that you call intangibles means a lot to you it sounds yes. like mm -hmm. uh, as it relates to uh, uh, getting the best bang for the buck if you will correct mm -hmm. any further discussion roll call please Verbic yes favor yes Vanukin yes Marquardt yes Fagan yes Noriko yes Smith Yes. Seven yes. And Mayor, if I could, I, just one other thing. Sure. Just to let you know, a quick note that this month uh, we've sold about three times the amount of jet fuel. We were up to about 8,600 gallons when we usually sell about 3,000. So we're, it's not there yet, but it's, it's trending the right way. So I just wanted to let you know. Good. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't believe there, are any, there is any new or unfinished business prior to uh, getting reports in terms of communications from our city council members. Is there anybody in our audience who prefers to make any public comments? If not, we'll go to communications. Alderman Finucan. I do would just like to wish everybody a, a very safe and, and happy 4th of July holiday. Uh, please be careful out there. Uh, pay attention to what the fire department shares with in terms of fireworks and uh, be careful. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Marquardt. I'd um, like to say thanks to the Celebration Corral for their program um, over the weekend over at NIU Patriotic Cantata. Um, did a fine job and also um, mentioned that First United Methodist Church their summer lunch and more program is in full swing uh, Tuesdays through Friday so um, they offer lunch um, homework help for the kids uh, so on and so forth so uh, if you want to take advantage of that thanks, thanks. Pat I've got two uh, one I'd like to thank everyone that came out to the town hall meeting Went, I think it went fairly well. Nobody, everybody <laughs> left with a smile on their face. Uh, the second is I'd like to uh, say uh, earlier this week I was out of town and we had a fire on prospect. The fire department was there. Um, I, when my wife was across the street. She sent me a picture when the fire department first arrived. By the time I got back in town, they were just cleaning up and finishing up, and I wanted to just say an excellent job. Thank you, Pat. Kate? No report. <laughs> I know what? it's a first. <laughs> Maybe you can, you know, I'll, okay. I'm hungry. I want to get home. <laughs> I see. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mike? Uh, Ward 6, a huge thought out, shout out and thank you to the DeKalb Park District. We have uh, an outstanding new playground at uh, Mason Park in the sixth ward and a lot of children out there uh, playing uh, noticing much more children out than uh, previously on the old old playground so thank you very much park district uh, secondly my comment would be sign sign everywhere a sign and i've uh, copied mayor smith and we have signs that sprout out in the public way all over the city and i noticed one just recently uh, the same company has signs all over the sixth ward all over the city of dekalb Sycamore and I noticed signs in Genoa from the same company uh, I'm, I'm sure expectingly without a permit but uh, it leads me to a point of uh, the notion of agenda building so as these things come up
could we consider uh, uh, an item on every agenda called agenda building for bringing up these kinds of things that, that come up uh, without tasking staff uh, any more than, than each of us as an individual? I would like consensus from council on these uh, issues or opportunities that come up. Thank you, Mike. It's about that verbic for sixth ward sign that I no no <laughs> <laughs> is that just, still out just there? Just joshing you. Okay, Tony. No report. Kate, I know you're hungry, but I've got just a few things to say. <laughs> uh, today, uh, early this morning, eight thirty or so, uh, Mohammed Labari, who is very involved with the Islamic Center of Dekal brought a big card in. Thank you. And I know Jean Lowry also received one uh, over at the police department. And I'd like to read this. It's a very short paragraph. On the behalf of the entire Muslim community of Dekal, we wish to say thank you for your service. As we celebrate the end of our holy month of Ramadan with a celebration called Mubarak, we feel truly blessed that we're protected by a team of people who are great at what they do. A team of dedicated, passionate, and caring professionals who look out for the citizens of our beautiful city of DeKalb. During the holy month of Ramadan, we felt safe, especially in our late night prayers, knowing that you're nearby and checked up on us to make sure we were all right. As a small token of appreciation, we hope that you share the joy of celebrating our holy, our holiday with some delicious sweets. I think they're all gone. You guys missed out. Uh, we did take those downstairs. They were excellent, yeah. Enjoy and thanks again for your service. Sure. You are much appreciated. I'm talking about food, yes. But I'm gonna leave this card here if anybody would like to see that. So we thank uh, our Muslim community for that. I know maybe Jean will have a, a comment or two on that also. I just want to make a shout out to Judy Schneider and our Public Works Department. If you've looked at our flower planters lately, gosh, are they beautiful. You know, you drive down Lincoln Highway and other places, they are really fantastically colorful. Uh, Mike, you mentioned the Celebration Corral, wonderful Celebration Corral over the weekend, as was Greek Fest at Hopkins Park. We have the band concert coming up tomorrow night. We have a 4th of July fireworks and band concert next week. The Drum and Bugle Corps will be coming in mid-month. Uh, Kishwaukee Fest will be coming in mid-month. Uh, Gary Mullis and his Country Music School Supplies Drive is going to be held down at uh, the High Rise uh, on Taylor Street uh, for school supplies. So we have a lot of things going on in uh, the next 30 days. And I'm sure I didn't mention everyone. Um, I want to let the folks know at home that we consider, consider con continue to work very, very hard on economic development. We said we were gonna do that, we are doing it. There are so many projects that Joel and Charlton and her crew are working on, and we really appreciate the support of those who have come forward and said we wanna locate in DeKalb, Illinois. Whether that be in downtown Sycamore <coughs> Road, we're still pounding out the fine points of the Northwestern Medical Agreement out on Bethany Road, we have renewed interest in some of our industrial parks, and we are working very closely with the Economic Development Corporation. We also are working with our citizens. You know, we do get emails occasionally, do we not? <laughs> uh, and, but we're working on folks who want to help us. And, then, and, I, and I have reached out to them and said, we want your help. We don't want your just criticism. You know, criticism without any viable solution doesn't make too much sense. So we want to work with citizens on FOIA, on signage, Mike, that you alluded to, on our website. You know, our website isn't perfect, but it's, it's, it's pretty good. And we're working very hard with Mark and others in helping to, to make that uh, the case. Uh, there was a, a train stoppage procedure. There was a train stoppage today. I don't know if anybody got caught up on that. And I don't know exactly what the reason was. I'm told that perhaps it was a locomotive problem. Uh, but <coughs> I asked Anne Marie, do we have any procedures for notification from Union Pacific when these things happen? And we weren't aware of one. So 
Anne Marie, I appreciate you reaching out and, and, and we're going to devise one so that if we do have an emergency, of course, Gene and Eric, you're got, you guys are going to know about that if, if, if God forbid somebody gets hit. Uh, but you know that thing was sitting there for what an hour probably while it while it crossed. And Gene, I know you're not in here, and I'm going to let you say something in just a moment. Um, the last several months has been so difficult for our partner, Northern Illinois University. And you know we saw the resignation of the president, and I just want all of us to try to get behind Lisa Freeman and the new administration at Northern and let them know that we want to continue to work with them. Uh, enough said on that. City Council priorities, what a great team you guys are. I really appreciate you bringing forward not only to me as your mayor but to staff what you think some of the priorities are. And Mike, your idea of agenda building, that's going to help us identify some more priorities. And as we move forward with an expanded program of Committees of the Whole, in which we will be able to spend more time on key issues, key to this community, I think you're going to find that this City Council will move forward on a number of items. Finally, there's a fellow in the back here, Jeff Bertel, who has spent 30 years uh, with the City of DeKalb. Jeff's in that control room back there. Hi, Jeff. Uh, he has worked with IT, web, public works, etc. He's going to be retiring, and I know they're going to have a little cake and coffee, I think, here on Thursday uh, for, for Jeff as he retires from the city. Kate, I know you're hungry, but I'm going to go right <laughs> up that row again I can, I can uh, hear that. and see if anybody else wants to make a comment. And I do hope that uh, Gene or Eric mm -hmm. have something to say about that train. Mm -hmm. uh, Ruth, uh, anything? No report. Uh, Dean Frieders. It's briefly, Mayor. On Thursday, July 6th, the uh, Environmental Commission will be having a meeting and a public hearing. Part of that hearing will be a discussion of uh, prairie plantings and natural plantings. It is a topic on which the city has received a lot of uh, public input. Uh, there have been some residents that have brought forward concerns regarding the positive and negative impacts of that, and that's something the Environmental Commission will be looking at closely. And then ultimately, we anticipate that there may be some policy questions coming back to the City Council. I'll defer to Community Development Director Holdeman on the exact time that the public hearing starts, uh, but that is Thursday, July 6th, uh, so right after the 4th of July holiday. I think that Environmental Commission is going to have a meeting, their regular meeting at 4 o'clock, and then at 5 o'clock, right, they're going to move from back here into the City Council chambers for that public hearing. Anything else, Dean? No. Okay. And Marie Gora, City Manager. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Two things. First of all, I wanted to add my congratulations to Jeff Bertel. As he sat here at the front end of the meeting, I thought this is his last board meeting, so he's been able to serve the community for many years. So, uh, Jeff, thank you very much. Greatly appreciated. Uh, secondly, just want to advise that uh, we're working as staff uh, on a number of significant issues, and I will be working with the mayor to figure out the best prioritization of bringing these items to council. So some of them include the TIF phase out that we've talked about, uh, the follow up to the STEAM Learning Center, as well as Annie Glidden North uh, Corridor Plan. So these will all, uh, depending upon the mayor's direction, be happening and coming to you within the next two months. So thank you. Thank you. Assistant City Manager, Patty Hoppenstead. I'm also hungry, so no report. <laughs> <laughs> Jane Blowery, our police chief. Sorry about this, Patty, but uh, here goes. <laughs> uh, just, just kind of a safety in general uh, announcement in regard to July 4th. It's an extremely high service demand for both police and fire. Uh, we often see some pretty severe injuries as a result of the inappropriate handling of fireworks. And at times, those fireworks are often misinterpreted as other calls. So it, it puts us in kind of a quandary in response uh, to those calls. So we just ask the citizens to be cognizant of the ordinance and do their best to be good neighbors. Uh, secondly, a shout out to uh, the Islamic Center President, Mohammed Labadi. He and uh, Dr. Rakish came to the police station this morning, again, delivering many sweets, such as what came to City Hall. There were some uh, sweets that were of Mediterranean and Middle Eastern uh, origins or recipes, 
but there were also the good old traditional donuts. Uh, so there was an effort to reinforce the police stereotype. <laughs> uh, but the Islamic Center membership and uh, Mohammed Labadi are true friends of the city, and uh, they're looking for ways to build some bridges with us uh, in, uh, across the board, but with the police department as well. So we look forward to enhancing that relationship. Last but not least, on July 8th, the Police Benevolent and Protective Association will be hosting a golf art outing at River Heights. It's uh, our, one of our, it is our biggest fundraiser, and the Benevolent does many charitable things in the community, uh, uh, and that money is used for those charitable uh, donations or events. So if anyone's interested in attending that golf outing or participating in a foursome, please contact the police station or look at our Facebook. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Eric? First of all, I want to congratulate uh, Jeff Bertel on his retirement and thank him for putting that fine uh, video uh, piece together last minute for me. Uh, next, I'll talk about the train. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I found the train uh, incident. Uh, city manager <coughs> contacted me as I was coming north on 7th Street. I was able to track down a uh, representative from UP and uh, told me there was a problem with the train and they expected it to be down about 40, 45 minutes. Uh, what the fire department did is we uh, uh, split our crews in half, uh, so each uh, side of the city had uh, equal fire protection because we knew there would be problems, uh, you know, getting through, uh, you know, to either side of the track. I also did discuss with Ch uh, Chief Lowry, and he was working on some traffic control measures in order to get people through uh, the two underpasses quickly. So uh, we were on top of it, and uh, I believe uh, uh, Tim Holderman is going to work on getting a meeting set up with uh, UP to uh, resolve that down the road. Finally, i got one more thing here, and I want to talk about a recent tragic fire, and that happened in London. Uh, early in the morning on uh, June 14, uh, 2017, uh, more than 200 firefighters responded to a massive high-rise fire in a 24-story building, the Grenfell Tower in London. To date, the fire has claimed about 79 lives, and many more have been injured. Uh, and the fire has been believed to be started by a faulty freezer. We had the exact same fire here last week, a faulty freezer. Uh, we didn't have that kind of damage. Could the fire have been prevented? Yeah, fires happen. Uh, could the large loss been prevented? Most definitely. Uh, and those are prevented by building codes. Uh, some of the problems they had over there, many of the survivors said they cannot hear the alarms going off or were not present. We do not waver on fire alarms here. We make sure they're loud and make sure they go off. Fire sprinklers, in a high rise in our area, we're going to have sprinklers. Same thing with energy efficient cladding, which caused the fire to jump many stories quickly. We do, uh, our building codes prevent that. Today, I want to talk about what's going on over there. London officials, they're trying to uh, play catch up. Currently, they have identified 60 buildings that have the same issues. And as of Friday, they'd already displaced 800 people uh, and evacuated five different high rises. We had a problem evacuating or displacing eight last week. I can only imagine what 800 would do. Uh, in 2015, Council approved the Commercial Building Ordinance and Inspection Program. Uh, to date, we've done about 700 buildings in town and found many violations. Uh, most recently, uh, the City of DeKalb enacted the 2015 International Code Set, which is the most up-to-date code set available, and I would hope in 2021 the Council would look again for the next revision. So thank you for your commitment to fire safety. and. Uh, Thanks. Thank you, Eric. All right, uh, Interim Finance Director, Jeff Wilkin. No, nothing at this time. No report. Joellen Charlton, Community Development. Two quick things. I also want to congratulate Jeff on his retirement and wish him well. Uh, in addition to a lot of the presentations that we put together that involve the PowerPoint presentations, it takes quite an effort by that group back there to take those and put them together and make them available for our presentations both here and at the zoning uh, planning and zoning commission meetings as well so wish him well also to build on what chief hicks was talking about uh, the cladding material that was used on the exterior of that building uh, came about as a result of people wanting to improve the appearance of the of the building partially and also because they were hoping to make the building more attractive to others in the in the nearby community uh, despite the fact that it, it didn't have a lot of good fire prevention capabilities. 
in the article, it talks a lot about being business friendly to the developers uh, in the community and not having them do the extra uh, provisions for the material that would have made it fire retardant. So when we talk about being business friendly in the community, I just want to uh, you know, keep telling everyone that it doesn't mean that we're ignoring the codes or stepping uh, the, the codes to the side. Instead, what we, do, we try to do is work with people to become code compliant, give them time, talk about options, and keep everything focused towards uh, improvements that are code compliant. So I just wanted to build on what Chief Hicks said in that regard. Tim Holdeman. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, wanted to give an update on the Illinois State uh, projects. Illinois 23 resurfacing uh, <coughs> is currently uh, delayed because of the lack of a budget. Our Kishwaukee bike path uh, project uh, may be delayed. It's anticipated to begin construction July 10th, so if there is a, a budget, that project will be able to proceed. Uh, we are moving forward on our street maintenance project, our local street maintenance project. Uh, and as Brian uh, Favor mentioned, uh, we are moving forward on the construction of our water mains uh, for 2017. And remember, uh, there is a meeting on July 5th, beginning at 6 p.m. at 20, uh, I'm sorry, at 1216 Market Street uh, to review the impacts of that uh, project. Also, would uh, like to thank um, the Community Foundation for their tour of the South Kishwaukee Branch Watershed. Uh, an outstanding tour uh, with Dean Johnson and Anita Zerberg. Uh, would highly recommend it. It's an annual event and would recommend uh, our residents and others uh, to go on that tour. Uh, also wanted to say thank you to the Kishwaukee United Way uh, for their day of caring on uh, the 22nd. Uh, we had three uh, individuals who uh, assisted us in doing some landscaping. That was uh, very, very much appreciated uh, from them. And then lastly, I'd like to give an update on our asset management plan street and fleet project. We're moving forward on that project. Uh, we're making good progress. We did have a little bit of a hiccup uh, we were basically uh, the IMS uh, consultants that we had to do the street uh, modeling, the, the pavement modeling, uh, were non-responsive to us. Uh, they apparently didn't have time to do the project, and so we got a local uh, engineer, Engineering Enterprise Incorporated, to assist us. They have experience in uh, Paver Pro, which is the product, that, the software that we're using, and so uh, without any increase in cost, uh, we're moving forward with them on the project. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Human Resources Director, Chris Randall. Thank you, Mayor. I also want to congratulate Jeff Bertel on his retirement. 30 years of service with the city is a lifetime of wonderful accomplishments that will be remembered from years to come. And if you think that we are giving him a break on his last week, that is not true. He's still working um, and, and, and helping us go through all of those to-do lists before you go kind of thing. So thanks, Jeff, for helping HR this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Our IT Director, Mark Thorson. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. I um, wanted to just give a brief update on the Enterprise Resource Planning Project that's going on. We just recently had a uh, question and answer meeting, a pre-proposal meeting as it is, um, uh, recently. and. Uh, had a lot of good questions. We compiled all those questions with answers and, and posted that back up on the site um, as an addendum. And um, we're keeping our ears open just in case there's any other questions that the, the proposing vendors may have. I want to say we had at least uh, seven represented at that meeting. And I know we're close to uh, a dozen vendors that are interested in, uh, in in this project, so we're really excited about that. And uh, I know it's uh, there's been quite a bit of thanks, and uh, I would like to throw my thanks in there as well to Jeff Pertel uh, as, as his teammate. And uh, I know uh, I've only been here a short time, but I know he's done quite a lot of wor good work for the city, and uh, we really appreciate it and uh, congratulate him on his uh, new adventures. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. I understand that we do need to recess for executive session. So I'd like to have a motion for approval to hold an executive session to discuss executive session minutes as provided for in 5 ILCS 120-2C21. 
I need a motion to hold our executive session. So, so moved. moved. Been moved by Alderman Verbeek, seconded by Second. Alderman Marquardt. Roll call. Favor? Yes. Finucane? Yes. Marquardt? Yes. Fagan? Yes. Noriko? Yes. Verbeek? Yes. Smith? Yes. Seven yes. Motion passes. We will now move into executive session.